It's amazing to think it's coming up to four years since I started doing this. When I started, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I did have a couple of principles in mind. One was to try and read stories that no one else was reading, and two was to work directly with authors who share their stories with me. One of the first absolute classics I ever got to read was by tonight's author, Lucretia Vastea. Now, I've only done two more in the meantime, so tonight will be the fourth story I've read by her, but all of them have been absolutely phenomenal, among my all-time favourites. Hope you agree by the time you finish listening to tonight's story. Another brilliant one. Well, my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Part 1. Something's there. Class had started no more than three minutes ago, and Danny's hand was already up and dangling. Mr. Swatson was getting annoyed. Danny used to be such a nice kid, never bothering the class, always doing his homework properly, hell, even explaining the day's lesson to the one or two dunces who never understood anything. He would always praise the boy for his good behaviour and hunger for knowledge. However, Mr. Swatson has been holding back on the praises lately, and that is because Danny's raised hand during class stopped being for participation purposes. Mr. Swatson, may I please go to the toilet? What was Mr. Swatson supposed to say? Or Miss Peeble, or Miss McCoy? The entire teacher lounge was talking about Danny with sunken eyebrows and harsh undertones. Disrespectful, they called the boy. It was clear to everybody that Danny was purposefully waiting for class to start, to excuse himself to go to the bathroom. And they were right. He was doing it on purpose. But what the teachers didn't know is that the boy hated going to the toilet during class. He had no choice, however, because well, the last time he did go to the bathroom during break time, this happened. Flush him again, Wayne. Danny tried to pull his head out of the toilet, but he hadn't been blessed with puberty yet and was being held down by two upperclassmen who were. I thought I told you I need it by Thursday, Collins. Danny was trying to explain himself between flushes, but Marvin wouldn't have it. Wayne, keep flushing him until I tell you to stop. The water was so cold. Danny's nose was bleeding. Marv, I think his nose is bleeding. Marvin pulled Wayne upright and grabbed Danny himself. You think your pussy-ass nose is impressive, Collins? Where the fuck is my book report? You're supposed to have it done by third period. I'm sorry. Danny was breathing greedily. I'm so sorry. I couldn't finish the book and I had to go to Grandpa's with my parents last week. Marvin yanked Danny's head back in the toilet with so much force, the boy hit his head against the hard margin. The cold water and bleeding nose were nothing compared to the fresh ache of his forehead. I don't give a flying fuck, you shit eater. I told you to do it. If I get my hands on you after school, I'm going to skin you alive. Marvin flushed Danny's head one last time before standing up and ordering his boys to follow him. Everybody was scared of Marvin. Wherever he would go, he would always have his oversized bright orange jacket with a blue zipper on and an entourage of three faithful followers. His jacket was his trademark. People didn't even have to look in his direction to see him approaching from the corner of their eyes. That's what Marvin loved about that jacket. Not because it was expensive and not because it made his shoulders look wider than they actually were. It's because, wherever he went, it was announcing his presence from afar. Mike and Wayne were Marvin's muscles, while pretty boy Jimmy was his eyes and ears. They weren't always together, but when they were, it was bad news. Danny had a couple of friends, but they were too afraid to stand up for him, or even be seen talking to him. It would have been pure suicide, now that Danny was King Marvin's new target. Feeling like he'd received enough beating for one day, Danny emptied his locker and went home. No teacher saw him leave, but he still had a good rep amongst the school staff, so people just assumed he'd felt sick or something. Oh, he felt sick all right. It was late fall and the cold air against his facial wounds was killing him. His forehead had a swollen horizontal bruise and... Even though he wiped his nose with the sleeve of his hoodie, he only managed to wipe off the dry blood above his lip. His chin, neck and shirt could still give the nosebleed away. 
Danny didn't want to cry. The shame he felt wouldn't let him off the hook that easily. Sunken into thoughts, he didn't notice that he'd already reached the wooden bridge. As upset as he was, the creepy house on Boone Street wasn't creeping him out today. Usually he'd speed up the pace as soon as he'd reached the lake. Well, every girl and boy was afraid of the creepy house on Boone Street and the still, dark lake across from it. It was an immense property. The house had three stories and looked old and unkempt, not to mention the roses that would grow wild and spiky all around it in untamable patterns. It was a shortcut only meant for joggers or students, because even though the bridge itself and the pathway following the bridge were wide enough for cars to pass through, the wild roses were reaching their limbs outside the fence of the creepy house, far enough to cover over half of the pathway. Ouch! Danny acknowledged the spiked rose that scratched his cheek. He was halfway through the pathway when he stopped and turned with angry eyes. The rose that scratched him was abnormally long, but beautiful and contrary to Marvin. It was a bully he could hurt back. Danny grabbed the pretty flower in his hand, and just as he wanted to twist and rip, the tears started pouring with such fervor, even Marvin and his followers would have felt a little sorry. Danny let the rose go. Just one petal fell off it, and, out of reflex, he bent over to pick it up and see if he could attach it to the rest of the rosebud. The boy knew it was pointless, but in his childish mind, he could at least try. That's when it struck him like lightning. Someone's watching me. He looked up at the house, and his blood froze in his veins. She was young. As young as him, or maybe a little younger. And, as irony would have it, she had long black hair and was wearing a white hooded dress, or robe. Danny couldn't tell, and he didn't stick around to unravel the details. She was the embodiment of every ghost-themed horror movie. Danny ran like a bat out of hell, and by the time he got home, Marvin's bullying from before was just a little less bad than seeing a ghost. Part 2. And it's moving. Mom and Dad asked questions, but Danny, well, he fell. He swore. No, of course school was going great, and of course he was fine and getting along with everybody. No, he didn't know why Mr. Swatson would call them to ask why Danny was acting so strangely lately. Dad, is there another shortcut to school except the one by the lake? Uh, no, but... You can take Fork Street and then turn left on Maples. Oh, that was the long way to school. Danny would have preferred the long way to school a hundred times over the shortcut, if it meant avoiding the creepy house with its mean plants, but taking Maples was just as bad, or probably worse. Marvin lived on that street. Yeah, I know. Never mind. Oh, I lived in this town my whole life and only took that shortcut once. I can still remember it. Yeah, I was in third grade and was late for math. Oof, crept the hell out of me. We used to call that house Manson Manor back in the day. His dad shuddered and laughed in an attempt at hiding it. Yep, I admire you, Danny. You're way braver than your old man was. But Danny sunk his head in shame. If his dad only knew the reason why he was taking the shortcuts, he would laugh in his damaged face. You can see those damn roses from Joss and Christine's baby room. Their house is three streets away from Runa's, for Pete's sake. Danny's mom interfered. Does anyone still live there? Beats me. Last I heard, the old lady that owned the place died and left it to her daughter and granddaughter. And this was 15 years ago, mind you. Just be careful around there, okay, honey? Sure, mom. But it was not an old, weird-looking house that Danny was supposed to be careful around. He began seeing Marvin's face during class in the window of his classroom door. The bully was looking for him. Lucky for Danny, Tom Whisk, the boy sitting in front of him, was very tall, so Danny could hide behind him every time Marvin's angry eyes were seeking their new favorite victim. He felt like a bird in a cage, trying to hide from the hungry cat. Problem is, this cat was a snake. Kids like Marvin were not afraid of teachers or parents. The one thing he was afraid of 
was being made a fool of in front of the followers he called friends. And that is exactly what Danny did. He dared come to school, even though he didn't have Marvin's book report with him. And unless he'll manage to convince his parents to be transferred to another school, his ass was bacon by the end of the year. Danny would always wait 15 minutes after school was over to go home. And if that wasn't enough of a precautionary measure, he would also take the scary shortcut to avoid Marvin Street. After the day with the toilet incident, he made it a rule to never look up at the creepy house again. The last thing he needed was to freak himself out bad enough to start taking the long way home, passing by Marvin's house. He'd be willingly throwing himself into the lion's open mouth, or the snakes, as it had already been established. Ghosts were scary, but Danny doubted their punches were as painful as Marvin's were. Even so, it was two weeks after seeing the girl in the window when he stopped dead in his tracks by the bridge and reconsidered the scary versus painful scale in his mind. There was something moving at the other end of the bridge, in the left corner. A small, crouched figure with black hair was trying to pull something out of the water. Danny froze. He thought about turning back and taking the long way around, but he was simply too close to home to chicken out. Regardless, he couldn't move. The figure's head turned to look in his direction, and Danny flinched as he recognized the little girl in the white dress he'd seen that one time in the creepy house's window. She fixated her eyes on him, and Danny knew that whatever was about to happen, turning back was not an option. He carefully advanced on the bridge, making it his day's purpose not to look the little girl in the face. The little girl took no mind of him, and turned her head back to whatever she was doing in the water. The wood was creaking under Danny's steps, and, given the circumstances, he couldn't decide if he should walk slower or faster. His determination faltered, and Danny threw the little girl the briefest glance. Reflexes work that way. She was looking straight at him, still crouched above the water. The corners of her lips lifted upwards, Hello. Danny sprinted. As soon as he got home, he locked all the doors leading up to his room. That night, he dreamt of demons wanting to eat his soul. And even though the demons were all black-haired little girls, they wore oversized orange jackets with blue zippers. Part 3. It's a lie. Next day, Danny took a brave and very mature decision regarding his way home from school. He decided to take the long way round, passing by Marvin's house. How bad could it be? He didn't see much of Marvin that day at school anyway. And so, after the daily wait of 15 minutes after school was over, Danny marched forward. He walked and walked and walked and walked right by the crossing which led to the bridge turning daringly on Maples, Marvin Street. Danny smirked. Wouldn't you know it? No danger in sight. That was awesome, Benny. Keep it up. A boy in an oversized orange jacket barged out of a liquor store ten feet in front of Danny. He pulled along another boy, a blonde kid in a punk rock excuse of an outfit, and kept walking forward with his arm around the other's neck. Marvin and Jimmy. They didn't see him, but Danny wasn't risking anything. He turned around, sweating and praying that the boys don't notice him, and they didn't. To his sweet relief, their voices, loud and obnoxious, could be heard further and further as he reached the crossing a second time. Knowing he had no other choice, Danny advanced towards the bridge, acknowledging the tiny figure bent over the water. She turned her head towards him, and then back to the water. He didn't speed up his pace this time. Now that he took a better look at her, there was no way this little girl was a ghost. There was no white robe in sight, just a red and yellow striped shirt under a black velvet overall. She was indeed pale, but there was a very human bruise on her left knee, and her hair was not black, 
but dark brown. Unlike the other day, she had no intention of saying hi. Instead, she kept poking with a stick around the water, raising it to her face for inspection ever so often. Sensing a fellow human, Danny paid better attention to what she was doing. The little girl was fishing for tadpoles with a butterfly net, and as soon as he saw her grabbing one of them, with its tail squirming between her thumb and index finger, Danny came to a halt and found his angry voice. Hey, stop that, you bully. The girl looked at him wide-eyed, her eyes like two chocolate marbles. Why? Because you're hurting them. She inhaled sharply and threw the tab hole back into the water, shocked of what she'd just found out. My God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't know. She sunk the purposeful end of her butterfly net back into the water and let the other tadpoles swim away. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Danny found her reaction kind of funny, but he was also sorry for accusing her like that. She did seem genuinely distressed. That's okay. Only a few of them survived to become frogs anyway. The girl looked at him with questioning eyes. They become frogs? Yeah. Oh. Danny remembered to keep on walking. You almost heard a rose too, you know. He looked at her, not sure he knew what she meant. I saw she hurt you, so I called her back in the garden. Violence doesn't work with them. You need to ask nicely. Danny was at a loss for words. Um, okay. A sudden smile shone all over her face. You learned something from me today, and I learned something from you. Mom said friendship is bringing out the best in another person and letting that person bring out the best in you. Can we be friends? Danny chuckled, and the little girl looked very hurt. <laughs> sure, I mean, we can try, but please don't cry. This upset her even more. I'm not. She turned her head back to Danny and crouched next to her butterfly net once more. Forget it. You don't want to be friends. Nobody wants to be friends with the girl who lives in the creepy house on Barnard Street. Well, she wasn't exactly wrong, but Danny felt like an asshole, and an asshole was something he was definitely not. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I ran away from you yesterday. She looked at him. All signs of incoming sadness gone. Yeah, that's okay. I get that a lot. He pretty much expected that answer, but what he didn't expect was a sweet smile that followed it. The question he asked next came as involuntarily as a hiccup. Hey, what's your name? I can't tell you that. Kids like you laugh when they hear my name. It's a weird one. Just call me whatever you like. Danny frowned. Can I just call you by your name? She looked his way and blinked once before answering. It's Clotho. Well, that is a weird name. Told you. I'm Danny. Clotho smiled again. Can I ask you for a favor, Danny? What favor? Well, what not weird girl name would be closest to my name? Danny was dumbfounded. What? What? Not weird girl name would be closest to my name. Well, that'd be... What's your name again? She pouted. Clotho. Right, um... Claire, I guess. No, Chloe. Yeah, Chloe would be a not weird alternative. Alternative? What does that mean? Alternative. What you're trying to do right now? You're trying to replace something with something else. The girl looked like a light bulb just ignited above her head. Oh, like replacing something bad with something good? Danny was stuck, and he didn't like being stuck, especially when it came to mind games. He was not the strongest in the schoolyard, but he was definitely among the smartest. Oh, yeah, exactly. Wow, I'm learning so much from you. We're going to be great friends, Danny. Right. Okay, um, Chloe. Danny forgot her name again, but he'd be damned if he'd admitted anew. 
Is it okay if I call you Chloe? Sure, Danny. Okay. Well, I need to get going now. Why? You just got here. Yeah, but I'm only passing through. I'm not, like, visiting or anything. Oh, right. Your mom's waiting for you. That wasn't precisely the case, seeing how his mom was always working late and Danny was home alone for three hours after school until his dad got home. But that was not something his new friend needed to know. Well, okay then. You'll come by tomorrow again, won't you? Yeah, I'm taking this path every day. I know. I saw you. Danny was creeped out. But her smile was so innocent and sweet... He decided it was no way she meant that in a stalker type of way. Well then, see you tomorrow, Chloe. Yeah, see you tomorrow, Danny. Part 4. It's a she. Now that the weird girl was harmless, Danny was fine with taking the shortcut. He still had to wait the 15 minutes after school for Marvin and his bodyguards to be out of sight. But his way home was not a problem anymore. He found it weird that Marvin started ordering Mike and Wayne to run ahead, just for him and Jimmy to follow along a couple of minutes after. But that still didn't interfere with the 15-minute rule. Danny would always be looking out the classroom window with his back glued to the wall so that his bullies couldn't see him in case they looked up. He was 50 feet away from the bridge when he saw Chloe wave enthusiastically in his direction. Hey, Danny! She was just so happy to see him. She shouted her greetings even though Danny was the size of a tadpole in her field of vision. You're early today. I wanted to meet you at your school, to walk you here. Danny was stunned that her yelling didn't summon more faces in the windows of the creepy house. He, however, was mannered enough to reply only when she was close enough to hear a level tone. Okay, why? Oh, so we have a little more time to chat. There are a couple of things I'd like to ask you. We need to know some things about each other, now that we're friends. Right. Why are you so early today? Early? He was late. Fifteen minutes late, in fact. Yeah, I'm actually late. Yesterday was just an exception. I didn't want Marvin to see me taking the long way home. Chloe's head bent slightly to the side. What does exception mean? Danny checked himself. Why did he just tell her about Marvin? She didn't have to know. Oh, it means something out of the ordinary. Uh, something that's not like the others, even though it should be. She smiled. Like you. What? No, not at all. I'm very ordinary, trust me. Chloe smiled at him like he just said the most naive thing in the world. I've tried making friends so many times, but they all ran away from me. The dark-haired girl leaned towards him a little without stepping forward. You are an exception to me, Danny. Danny blushed. He didn't know if he should thank her or ask her to never speak to him again, but she made the decision for him. What's your favourite colour? Danny chuckled. <laughs> you did not just ask me that. She got a worried look on her face. I did. What are you saying? It's the oldest question in the book. Chloe's face was a question mark in itself. What book? Jeez, what planet did you come from? Chloe seemed genuinely puzzled, and Danny was getting frustrated with her. He resumed walking and passed Chloe by with the sheer intention of getting home. He was off the bridge and on the pathway, passing by the roses that caused so much gossip amongst the housewives in town. Earth! I'm from Earth. Danny decided to ignore her. I don't understand this game we're playing. You have to tell me the rules first. Danny let out an exasperated sigh and yelled from the centre of the pathway in the girl's direction. All of them. All of what? All colours. I like every colour there is. Chloe was astounded. Really? I thought you'd say blue or something. Nah... I've always liked them all the same. I could never pick a favourite. Chloe was beaming. See? Told you. You're an exception. Danny couldn't help himself. 
His sudden good mood was undeniable. He thought the girl was dumb and weird, sure, but she definitely knew how to boost a loser's ego. <laughs> Thanks. You're an exception, too. Chloe's big eyes got even bigger. I am? You sure are. See you tomorrow, okay? She looked disappointed, but she still took his remark as a compliment. Okay, have a nice day tomorrow. Part 5. She's pretty stupid. He had no idea how it got there, and he had no idea what he did to deserve it. He only let his school bag out of sight for ten seconds at a time, whenever the ball landed in his hands and he needed to scan the court to see whom to pass it to. The gym teacher was fine with the kids leaving their school bags on the benches during sports. That, of course, was good for Danny, because the lock to his locker was busted, meaning he'd have to drag his rucksack with him everywhere. Even though they were older, Wayne and Mike were in Danny's gym class because both of them were slightly overweight and their parents told the gym teacher they would not be able to participate in sports due to their bad knees. Last time the teacher argued against such affirmations, he got himself a lawsuit, which is why he agreed for Mike and Wayne to just sit, watch and laugh at other kids from the side during sports. Wayne and Mark were chatting on the bench, throwing an eye to the basketball game ever so often. Danny would never have thought it was him they were there for. He simply did his best at being mediocre, grabbed his rucksack on his way out of the gym and, just like everybody else who'd been in constant motion for the past 50 minutes, went for the water bottle first thing when hitting the locker room. Danny probably would have noticed what was happening if he'd seen Mike getting his iPhone out to film him. It's like finally finding a toilet after holding it in for several minutes, like doing something illegal and still be found innocent after weeks of living in fear. It can also be compared to relief, be it sexual or otherwise. That first gulp of water after an exhausting workout could bring anyone to close their eyes and just dive into the blissful moment. In other words, that is exactly what Danny did. Just as he brought the bottle to his mouth, he closed his eyes and let it pour its contents into his thirsty cavity. He didn't see it. He just vaguely heard mild gasps around him. But he would never have thought they had anything to do with him. Until... Until he felt it moving on his tongue. Danny opened his eyes. He just saw the legs of something black and furry advancing into his mouth, maximized through the bottled water. He threw the bottle against the wall in front of him and fell to his knees with both hands around his neck. Some boys were laughing. Others were yelling. Danny placed an elbow on the floor and forced himself to cough up the contents he'd just swallowed. The vermin wasn't swallowed yet, but it was definitely struggling towards his insides. Danny was so desperate to get that disgusting, fuzzy movement out of him that he yanked his right hand into his mouth and grabbed the being by a leg with the help of two fingers. The spider was thrown on the floor for everyone to see and be disgusted by. It was huge, and scared too. But before it could find shelter under a bench, a merciless sneaker forced it to meet its maker. Danny was still coughing. Mike and Wayne were still filming. Danny's ears went deaf with rage. He was so angry, he imagined a massacre happening right then and there. Everybody who was making a big circle around him deserved to die a painful, bloody death. He imagined the walls painted red in the blood of those laughing at him, and yet the person who, he thought, deserved the most torture wasn't even there. Marvin. Who's that? Danny was startled. Chloe's big, dark eyes were studying him expectantly. He didn't even notice her there standing at the end of the bridge at a time of day he would normally never leave school. His mind had gone completely blank after sports. Danny never skipped class. Ever. He was turning into a badly behaved boy, and he knew it. His parents were going to get another call from Mr. Swatson that evening, and he dreaded it almost as much as he dreaded encountering Marvin. You're upset. Of course he was upset. Danny wanted to call her stupid, 
just to feel the comfort of knowing that there were people out there who were weaker than him. But Danny wasn't a bully, and no matter how stupid Chloe was, she was willing to be a friend right when he needed one most. Danny felt the incoming waterworks, and, to his own surprise, he walked angrily to the bridge's margin and sat down on the wood, his feet dangling above the water's mirror. Chloe joined him. For someone as stupid as he thought her to be, she sure had a feel for upset people. She just sat there, saying nothing, waiting for a friend to speak first. And he spoke all right. I hate them. Who? The bullies. I hate them all. Every bully that ever was and ever will be. They suck and they deserve to die. Danny was so angry, his eyes watered. As he tried wiping the annoying salty water out of the way, a gentle hand stroked his back. Let it out, friend. And just as Danny wanted to bark at her that he's not her friend and that he's fine, he let go. He cried and cried and cried, and told her everything there was to tell about the day he'd had. She did nothing of the things he thought she'd do, and said nothing of the things he thought she'd say. She didn't interfere by saying that Karma was going to get back to the horrible people he had to deal with. She didn't reassure him that, no, he wasn't worthless or a chicken, and that, no, he was wrong. Things were going to get better, and that people always change for the better as a result of growing up. She did nothing of what a friend was supposed to do, to make a befriended feel better. All she did was bow her head towards the water, listening to Danny cry and rant about his bullies. After he let all the poison out, Danny was under the mild impression that Chloe wasn't listening to him at all. That made him want to get up and run to his house, where he was most sheltered and could cry to the dearest friend he had, himself. But just as he made the slightest move towards standing up, Chloe grabbed his arm with the force of ten men and turned her dark-haired head to meet his eyes. Danny froze. It was a lovely spring day, but he couldn't remember ever feeling this cold. Compared to Chloe's frozen stare, being flushed down the toilet at school seemed like nothing. Do you want me to interfere? She sounded old, and angered. Danny was puzzled. For someone who didn't know what alternative or exception meant, interfere was a pretty big word. Um, interfere how? Should I erase everything he ever did to you? That's when Danny came back to his senses. I... Uh, I think I should go home. Chloe didn't even flinch. Mom's waiting for me? That part she heard. Oh, right. And let him go. Danny got up and swiped his right hand over the backside of his jeans a couple of times. He expressed a half-hearted goodbye to Chloe, and just as he turned around and took a couple of steps... Danny? What? I don't care what others think of you. I'll always be on your side, no matter what happens. Time stopped for Danny right then and there. He stared Chloe right in the face, considering her as stupid as ever. Even so, he decided he liked her be it as platonic as humanly possible. <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. She smiled, and pure happiness was radiating off of her. Sure, what are friends for? Part 6 But She's a Friend Danny's nose met with his own locker door with a hard dus. What was that, Collins? Danny was shaking in fear for his very life as he grabbed his bleeding nose. He was on his knees, looking up at Marvin and his three bodyguards. What do you mean you never read Crime and Punishment by that Russian bastard? I need that book report in two hours. You never told me about... Slam. Danny was on the floor, covering his face with his hands, afraid of the next impact. Oh, that's why you don't have my book report ready. Because I never told you about it. 
King Marvin kicked Danny in the leg. I don't have to tell you shit, Collins. Make it by tomorrow, and it better not be copied off the web. It was either Wayne or Mike who kicked Danny in the leg next. This deduction was made by the stronger level of pain he felt. Danny walked with a limp home, and Chloe noticed. What happened? I don't want to talk about it. Even so, he got comfortable on the bridge, with his feet dangling over the water again. Looks like you do, though. Danny sighed. Oh, I need to read Crime and Punishment by tomorrow. Ugh. Chloe sat down next to him. Grandma has that one. Oh, her library's huge. I can lend it to you, but you can't finish it by tomorrow. It's this big. Chloe showed a thickness of three inches with the help of her thumb and index finger. All Danny understood was that he was going to die in less than 24 hours. Can you just pretend to be sick and stay home? That actually sounded like a very good idea. Danny couldn't believe he'd ever thought the girl was stupid. I can try. Funny this option didn't even hit me. Well, please stay home tomorrow. I'm not in the mood to hear your name while Grandma's working her spin... Chloe clasped her hand over her mouth. What? I mean, just stay home, okay? And so... He did. Part 7. A Friend Full of Surprises Next morning, Danny got up an hour earlier than he should have and turned the heating system in his room on blast. Right before his mother was supposed to wake up, he let the thermometer rest on the bottom of the bathroom sink as he washed his hands and face with water so hot he thought his skin would peel off. He couldn't help but chuckle. Whether he'd stay home or go to school to meet Marvin, some mean God had something against him keeping his skin attached to the rest of him. Mother's alarm clock rang loudly from the other side of the wall by his bed, letting Danny know it was time to hide the evidence. He got a mouthful of hot water, placed a thermometer between his lips, turned the radiator off and snuck into bed without wiping the water beads off his forehead. His mother didn't notice the heat in Danny's room, he was a good kid and he rarely got sick, so she never even suspected that the sweat on his brow, the steaming face and the outrageous numbers shown by the Quicksilver was just a bunch of bull. She or Dad wanted to stay home, but Danny swore he would be all right. Going to school was out of the question, but Danny was going to be just fine. Being alone at home can be exciting for a 13 going on 14 year old. For the first three hours, that is. TV was no fun, so, rebellious as he felt, Danny got dressed and went for a walk right where he knew he'd find her. Hey! Chloe turned her head to see her friend approaching. She smiled and started dangling her feet above the water, reminding Danny of a dog who's happy their master's home. You're late. What do you mean I'm late? It's not even 12 a.m. yet. You're late for someone who faked being sick to stay home. Um, excuse you, I fake being sick to stay alive. Chloe chuckled and patted the wooden boards to her right. Danny took her invitation and sat down next to her. How come I see you every day now? I've been coming here for years and I've never seen you before. She hesitated. Well, now that I have a friend, I have more reasons to come play outside. You don't like playing alone? Oh no, I do, but... I've always wanted a friend. Danny shot her an incredulous stare. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me you've been coming outside more for me? Chloe blushed furiously. No, of course not. It's I've never had much reason to come outside before. The little girl turned around to look at her old, creepy-looking house. Mum and Grandma say well, I'm very important. Danny had to bite his tongue to suppress a sarcastic chuckle. I know that sounds wrong, but they say it's important for me to stay safe. They say well, the world's a very unsafe place. Her face had something very earnest about it. Something so solemn, it divulged both pride and pain. Danny had no idea how to react to it. They told me 
if anything was to ever happen to one of us three. Chloe turned her gaze from her house to her only friend, and Danny was close to screaming. Chloe's eyes turned from dark brown to sparkling white. That the world would end. No, her eyes were as brown as they always were. The sun was only playing tricks. Chloe sounded sad and Danny didn't like it. He grabbed her hand, pulling her out of her daze, and spoke as convincingly as a 13-year-old victim of school bullying could. You're just a kid. Chloe blinked twice in surprise. Sure, if something will happen. Sure, if something will ever happen to me, I, well, I'm sure my parents' world would end, but... That's no reason not to come outside at all. Yeah, the world is messed up, but it's also beautiful. You just have to find the courage to learn its ways. You can't just live cooped up in an old home. Want to see it? No impact at all. He had had one chance at delivering a life-changing speech, and he blew it. Chloe was back to her cheerful, childish, dumb, brown-eyed self again. Danny sighed. See what? My house. Um, yeah, I don't think that'd be such a good idea. Oh, come on, you worrywart. Mum and Grandma are in the backyard picking cotton. I can show you around for a bit until they come back. Danny wanted to excuse himself and go home, where he was expected to be lying in bed and resting. His head was already on its way to his house, but his heart, alongside his physical self, was following Chloe inside the creepy house on Boona Street. Few feelings are more powerful than fear. Curiosity is one of them. Welcome to my humble abode, Chloe chimed. I heard that one in a movie. <laughs> Come on. The girl ran towards the other end of the hallway. Danny wanted to take his shoes off first, but Chloe tugged impatiently at him. Hurry, we need to hurry. Danny followed her to something that looked like it had once been an enormous ballroom. Even though massive blackout curtains were covering every inch of window possible, the room was very well lit. Four chandeliers were hanging low above the ballroom. They were all powered by candles, not electricity. To the right of the room were two doors, and to the left, a couch and an enormous flat-screen TV. Far ahead were two staircases leading to the first floor and beyond. The massive double door that stood tall and proud between the staircases was open just a creak, further tickling Danny's curiosity. The floor was coated in a very expensive-looking gold and crimson-coloured rug, and Danny couldn't tell if the walls were painted or covered in wallpaper. Despite its scary shell and intimidating size, Chloe's home was very clean and very sophisticated-looking. However, it wore neither a welcoming hue nor a homey vibe. It was certainly big enough for a kid or five to play indoors, but definitely not suited for a child as cheerful as Chloe. The creepy house on Boona Street was big, strong, and ready to crush uninvited guests. That's the library, Chloe said, pointing to the open double door. Her next words guided her finger to the two identical doors on the right. That's the kitchen, and that's the pantry. The girl chuckled as she started walking towards one of the staircases. Danny followed. The kitchen and the pantry are almost identical. Mom and Granny think some things from the pantry belong in the kitchen, and that every pantry needs a table and chairs. Pictured it yet? Danny let out a short laugh. Oh, I'd love to show them to you, but I don't think we have enough time. I'm not allowed to bring friends over. I'm not allowed to bring friends over. Nor is she actually allowed to leave the house. No wonder she's so clingy, Danny thought. Say, Chloe, do you have any brothers or sisters? No. The two of them reached the first floor of the house. Mum had to give birth to one daughter. Her mum, my granny, had to do the same. And her mum, and her mum before that. And the mum before that, and so on. Danny was confused. And what if well, one of you was born a boy? Not possible. Chloe turned to look at him. Oh, I'm not allowed to tell you these things. Danny was genuinely intrigued. Neither are you allowed to have me over. But you're still doing it, aren't you? 
Poor Chloe looked puzzled. I won't tell anyone, Chloe. Danny was about to deliver the punchline, and, even though he meant it, it had an insincere undertone. I'm your friend. The girl sighed. I, I'd love to tell you about it, but I'm really not allowed to. Why did your eyes get so weird before? Chloe's posture went rigid. I've no idea what you're talking about. Yes, you do. A couple of seconds passed by without any of the two moving. Let's... Danny was all ears. Let's just keep going, okay? She sounded like she was beginning to regret letting Danny into her house. Chloe advanced on the dark hallway that stretched out in the depths of the first floor. I'm sorry. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. No, you're right. Danny counted three unopened doors she passed by. When she turned around furiously, grabbed him by the arm and led him out of the hallway and back to the staircase. Are you angry with me? Should I go home? No. Surprisingly, when reaching the staircase, they did not descend it as Danny might have expected. Chloe instead had Danny follow her to the second floor, where one old yet very well-kempt door stood before them. This is where my mother, grandmother and I work. Danny snapped his head in her direction. Did she say, I? How is it possible for a 12 or 13 year old girl to be put to work by her mother and grandmother? Before he had the chance to mention child protection services, Chloe inhaled deeply and opened the door. The attic was also well lit. This time, however, by pure daylight. The dust particles that swam through the air looked like glitter, and even though they were plenty, the room was very clean. Danny tried to comprehend what he was looking at. The wooden contraption seemed to be ancient, yet very steady and complex. The longer he stared at it, the more detail he was able to distinguish. Whatever it was, it was a beautiful tool, and the glitter swaying all around it made it look like the cover of a fairy tale. That day was not a particularly sunny one, but the room was so bright, Danny couldn't help but look for the source. And there it was, at the far end of the wooden machine, spreading light all across the room, were the biggest silver scissors Danny had ever seen. This spinning wheel has been in my family for generations. A spinning wheel, Danny thought, looked more like an intricate weaving loom always has to be three of us. The boy listened, enchanted. Clotho, the young, Achesis, the mother, and Atropos, the mother's mother. Chloe wasn't looking in Danny's direction. Even so, he recognized a hint of that earnestness from before, and, because of that, he withheld from asking about her father. In my family, Every death must be accompanied by a birth at the same precise moment. Her voice was melancholic as she reached out a hand to stroke the wood of the spinning wheel. It's the duty of every Clotho to give birth to the next one, as it is the duty of every Atropos to die and make room for the next one. A knife-sharp smile crept at the edges of her mouth as she turned her head to look at her friend. That's okay. Sooner or later, each and every one of us will get her chance at using the scissors. That's when Danny knew it was no longer okay for them to be friends. Ice-cold fingers grabbed him by the collar from behind and tossed him towards the stairs. Had his reflexes been any slower, he would have fallen to his most probable death. Strangely. How dare you enter the attic of the Moirai uninvited? Danny grabbed onto the handrail for dear life. The old woman in front of him was yielding garden scissors in both hands, and boy did she look pissed. It was me, Granny. I invited him. But Granny didn't hear anything. She threw one pair of scissors at Danny with the force of a cannon. Danny ducked at the very last moment, and the scissors broke through the handrail and five balusters. Run, Danny, run! 
and he sped down the stairs with a crazy old lady right behind him. Wait until I get my hands on you, you filthy little pig. Just as Chloe's grandmother was about to throw the second pair of scissors to the boy's doom, another hand grabbed Danny. He was forced to stop and hide behind the silhouette of another woman. This one was fairly younger. Calm down, mother. It's a friend of Clotho's. The old woman stops. Oh! And turned to look upwards at her grandchild who was crying rivers at the top of the stairs. Did you want to show him the attic, Clotho? Chloe throws. She stared at the two older women with nothing but fear in her eyes. She shivered and wept, but didn't say anything in Danny's defense. Of course she didn't, Mother. She might be stupid, but not that stupid. Danny suddenly felt the urge to punch the woman who was shielding him from the scissor-throwing monster. Look at him, just as shameless and despicable as all the other representatives of his gender. He must have run around the house as soon as Clotho let him in. Chloe's head sunk in shame. Danny couldn't believe that his friend wouldn't back him up in front of her family, especially since nothing was actually his fault. Look at me, my daughter. The girl looked at her mother. She looked so devastated. Danny pitied her more than himself for a second and expected her mother to comfort her, seeing the mess she was. When I explained to you that you will need to make a male friend in the future, I surely didn't mean someone this weak, and most certainly wasn't talking about now. More waterworks from upstairs, but she started descending slowly. Granny Gruesome stepped aside, letting Chloe get to her mother. Escort your friend outside and bid your farewell. But Danny didn't wait that long. He turned around and went down the stairs, not giving Chloe the chance to catch up with him. He opened the door and stepped out of the house, not even turning to say goodbye to his former friend. Wait, Danny, wait! But he didn't wait. He just kept on walking, angry as he was. I'm sorry. We're still friends, I promise. I'm still on your side. But Danny would hear none of it. He was too much inside his own head to actually take note of his way home, and it was the police car in his driveway that broke the days. A synonym for excrements escaped between Danny's pressed lips. When Danny stepped into his house, his mother was crying on the living room sofa next to a cop, while his father was making an erratic phone call. Where the hell were you? All three adults rushed to Danny as if they wanted to tackle him. What... What are you guys doing home this early? The surprise in his voice simply slipped out. I called to see if you're okay, his mom yelled. You were so sick this morning. I got worried when I saw you wouldn't pick up. Danny was close to hitting himself for being so stupid. His mother instantly placed her hands on his face. The fever's gone. But how? Danny was grabbed for the third time that day. Daniel... What the hell did you do? The boy was tired. Too tired to come up with a believable lie. I faked being sick to stay home today. You did what? Why? Even so, he wasn't tired enough to look a pussy in front of his father. Because I felt like it. The adults were stunned. Where in the hell were you? It didn't look like his mother would let it go, and he really didn't have a reason to lie to her. Answer me, Daniel. I made friends with the girl who lives at 17 Booner Street. Booner Street? 17? You mean the Manson man? Danny nodded and walked past his parents, heading to his room. Daniel, you are never to visit that place again. Do you understand me? Don't worry about it, Mom. He looked back at his mother with sad eyes. We're not friends anymore. The cop stood up, saying, Looks like you won't be needing me anymore, Mr. and Mrs. Collins. Just as Danny closed the door behind him. He couldn't hear him as clearly as before, but the cop's next words got to him loud and clear. Keep Danny away from the people of that old house. That place is all sorts of bad news.
Part 8. And so loyal. Mr. Swatson almost crushed the piece of chalk between his fingers, when he again turned his back to the blackboard to see that damn hand in the air. Danny, break time wasn't even five minutes ago. I'm sorry, sir, but I really need to go. His classmates all knew why Danny was doing this, but they didn't deem it necessary to share their knowledge with the teachers. I'm sorry, Danny, but I can't keep letting you do this. Danny's eyes went wide. All teachers but Mr. Swatson forbade him from going to the loo during class. He was his very last hope, and he really needed to go, so the urgency was twice as bad. Please, sir, it's really urgent. The teacher looked at him over the frames of his glasses. It's for the last time, Daniel. Do I make myself understood? Yes, sir. Mr. Swatson did nothing more. He motioned towards the door with his head, dismissing Danny to go to the bathroom. The boy was ashamed. He got out of the classroom and rushed to the men's toilet, thinking of strategies to avoid nature's calling during school altogether. Danny had just decided that he'd stop drinking anything before and during school, starting with the next day. When he opened the bathroom door and froze in its frame, Jimmy was bent over a sink his shoulder-length blonde hair covering the sides of his face. Even so, his blue gaze shot daggers at Danny in the mirror's reflection. Danny was just about to slam the door shut and run for his dear life when the upperclassman spoke. It's all right, little man. He looked sick. The sink he was leaning against was full of his sickness too. He's not here. Go do your business. If it weren't for his throbbing bladder... Danny would have fled anyway. He had no idea what Jimmy was doing or why he was in the toilet during class to begin with, but the boy did not look good at all. Last time he encountered friends of Marvin's, they were there to harm him. But there's no way Jimmy could have anticipated him being there at precisely that time of day. No time to think. Time to pee. Danny ran to the very first stall as he emptied the pressure in a bowl he once got all close and personal with. Jimmy gagged at the sinks, making Danny interrupt his thoughts for a second, but it's only when he heard someone else come in that his thoughts and flow of pee stopped altogether. There you are. I've been looking all over for you. Danny wanted to hit the wall in frustration. He whispered the synonym for excrements instead. He was getting pretty good at that. Marvin's boots were furiously speeding in Jimmy's direction. Oh, come on, Marv, please. And just as Danny expected a punch or some other violent image-inducing sound, he heard a wet suction noise, then another one, and another one. Danny's mouth fell again. He felt the need to touch the wall in front of him for balance. Marv! Stop! Why? You said you like it. And another one. I do, it's, it's just... Jimmy was desperately thinking of excuses. Danny was sure of it. I just puked. I think it was a soda. I'm not feeling too well. I can make you feel better. Come here. Another wet suction sound. This one lasted longer than the others. Marv, please stop it. I'm really not in the mood. Marvin chuckled. But it wasn't a mean chuckle, like the ones he gave Danny when he was begging for mercy. It was loving and understanding. It's okay, babe. I'll wait for whenever you're ready. Steps were heard, followed by a mild tug on the other side of the wall to Danny's left. It was clear as day. Marvin cornered Jimmy against the wall. But that won't stop me from doing it to you. Danny heard Jimmy gasp in panic as sounds of zippers and wrinkling fabric filled the toilet. Marvin, don't. Be quiet. You'll feel good. Really good. I said no. Why not, damn it? Why not? You said you want this. You said you want me just as much as I want you. Marvin hit the wall above Jimmy's head. Danny flinched violently. 
I need this. Don't you get it? I need it so bad. It's driving me insane. You're driving me insane. More wrinkling fabric and wet kissing sounds. Danny wished he were deaf. This was bad. This was very, very bad. He was not supposed to hear this conversation. It's not that I don't want you. It's just... What? What is it, babe? You know you can talk to me. Danny closed his eyes in defeat. He knew what Jimmy was about to say. He couldn't blame the guy. If he'd have been in Jimmy's situation, he too would have given that excuse to save himself from being violated by a person he's afraid of. We're not alone. There's someone in the store behind... Danny was out of the toilet before Jimmy even had the chance to finish his sentence. He ran and ran and ran, ignoring all the shouting happening behind him. He ran across the hall, past the security guard's office, and continued running until he was at the bridge. The shouting never ceased. You're dead, Collins. You're freaking dead. I'll kill you and skull fuck you after I'm done. Danny ran home. He ran so fast and was so blind to the world he was passing by that he didn't even notice the black-haired girl in her white robe at the window of the spooky house on Booner Street. She was crying. But Danny wouldn't have been able to see that, even if he did look up. Good thing the house keys were in his back pocket. After letting himself in, Danny went straight to the bathroom to do what Jimmy did not even 30 minutes prior. He didn't puke out of disgust. He puked out of fear. His entire body was shaking. He'll transfer schools. Yeah, yeah school transfer. That's it. His parents would understand. Brushing his teeth and pacing around his room didn't help, neither with the icky taste in his mouth nor the weight of the information he'd received against his will. He waited for the computer to start up and seriously considered looking for his mother's calming pills in his parents' bathroom. Browsing through everything which was needed for a school transfer, Danny took out a notepad to take notes. He needed to be very prepared when his parents would get home, but little did he know. He'd never get the chance to put those notes to good use. The house phone rang. Its sound cut like burning iron through butter in the dead quiet of the house. Danny let it ring because, well, technically, nobody was supposed to be home, and the phone eventually stopped ringing. Not even five silent seconds passed, and the phone rang again. It rang with a fury only tired middle-class workers get to know due to their early morning alarm clocks. When the phone rang the third time, Danny knew it was for him. He rushed to it, inhaled deeply, and prayed to God it wasn't one of his parents. Hello? Daniel Brady Collins, what in the world did you get yourself into? Oh, great. Danny seriously regretted not having the notes with him. Mom, I can explain. What the hell is this I'm hearing? You excuse yourself to go to the bathroom in the middle of class and left school? Oh, Mr. Swanson told me you've been acting strange all semester, but I never would have thought that of my son. Mom, it's not what you think. Oh, really? Then mind telling me how the hell your grades are declining suddenly when just last year you were in the top three of your class. And why do you excuse yourself to go to the bathroom during class every chance you get? Oh, I swear to God, Danny... I hope it's cigarettes. Mom, I hope it's cigarettes because if I find out you're taking drugs, son, God help me out. Mom, I'm being bullied. Mother did not expect that one. You are? Since when? Why didn't you tell me? I can't just tell my parents I'm being bullied. Hello? I'm 13, going on 14. I have to start fighting my own battles. Does fighting your own battles imply you running away from school during class? Ouch. I can't go to the bathroom during breaks, because he always catches me there, Mum. Today he cornered me in the toilet during class. That's why I ran away from school. It was either silence of relief or loss of words. No bully can be that bad. 
Mom, I prefer peeing my pants in class than risk meeting him in the bathroom. Trust me, he is that bad. She was still angry with him, of course, but it was clear as day that his mum was happy with the explanation. Even so, her anger was overpowering every other feeling she had. I want to transfer. Don't be silly, Danny. It's probably just a phase. This phase is making me fail all my classes. Do you want that? Mom let out a sound of surrender. I'll talk about it when your dad and I get home tonight. Okay, honey. Danny smiled victoriously, but little did he know his victory would be very short-lived. You didn't leave your things at school, did you? Danny was just about to tell her that it's fine, that his belongings are safe in his locker, but then he remembered. Oh, crap. The door to my locker is busted. He wished he hadn't said that out loud. What? You need to get your butt back to school and get your things, young man. All colour fled from his face. Mom, I can't. Didn't you just hear what I said? I did. We'll talk about it all tonight. But right now, I really need you to be brave and go back to school and get your things. But Mom, class just ended. School's out for the day. Very few people know that the lock on my door is busted. I can go get them... No buts. You're going now, and that's final. Your dad and I are not getting you a new iPhone and Nintendo just because of some bully. She had a point. Danny always took his favorite pieces of technology to school with him. He's not about to give them up for the likes of Marvin. Class is over for the day, baby. He won't be there. But Danny knew better. He hoped, from the very depths of his being, that she was right and hung on to that hope all the way back to school. But he knew better, regardless. Part 9 She's your friend, but everyone else's enemy. The fear that was curling up in Danny's chest made him believe that the entire world was plotting against him. The sky was getting dark, and when he got to the pathway by the creepy house, the wild roses were stretching through the gaps between the fence's iron bars, more daring than ever before. The lake's water was getting darker, its mirror not as reflective as it should have been, not to mention that the bad weather light made the bridge seem quite unstable. To sum it up, it was turning out to be a really shitty day. The schoolyard came into sight. It was deserted. Danny could only see the janitor up on the second floor of the school building, running his typical errands. The wind blew mercilessly, and Danny's heart was beating inside his chest like a wild animal stuck in a cage. He was hurrying to the entrance, gliding along walls and trying to make himself as unnoticeable as possible. He wanted to believe that, once he was inside the school, he was home free. There's no way Marvin and his bullies would wait inside the school for him, risking getting caught by the janitor or security guard. The building was almost empty, so Danny's screams would echo everywhere. Danny opened the gate. The security officer was nowhere to be seen. He took a couple of steps and exhaled in a vague attempt at silencing his paranoia. His paranoia, however, was there for a reason. Damn it, kid. I thought you knew better than to come back. Danny turned around just in time to see Mike placing his iPhone back in the pocket of his jeans. The broad-shouldered boy opened the gate and gestured for Danny to follow him inside. He has your stuff. Follow me. Danny backed up a few steps. Mike stared at him, surprised by his defensiveness. Dude, I'm not asking you to follow me. I'm telling you to. Don't be stupid. It'll hurt less if you do what you're told. The poor, 13, going on 14-year-old boy felt unwanted tears swell up in his eyes as his knees got uncertain of the balance they were supposed to keep. I got no idea what you did to piss him off so badly. I didn't do anything. I don't know about that, but 
I do know it'll get worse if you don't follow me. Daddy swallowed, even though his mouth and throat were as dry as Saudi Arabia. Where is he? By the oak tree. This wasn't bad. This was far worse than bad. You coming? Or do I have to drag you? Danny followed Mike outside and behind the building, where the oak tree was. Every student who smoked, every student who wanted to make out, every student who had something secretive to do or something secretive to show and wanted little to no risk of getting caught, would go to the oak tree behind the building. The tree's crown was massive and heavy. The umbrella its crown created throughout the years originated one of the most loved mottos among the students. Anything that goes down at the oak tree stays at the oak tree. And no other truth was weighing heavier on Danny's shoulders at that point. The security guard was too far away to hear his screams, should there be any, and the janitor wouldn't be able to see anything due to the oak's leafy branches, even if he were to open the window. Danny wished he would have valued his life more than he valued his iPhone and Nintendo half an hour ago. Marvin's orange jacket with the blue zipper leaning against the tree trunk was the brightest thing in the picture of an upcoming storm. He looked the angriest Danny had ever seen him, and judging by the huge grin Psycho Wayne had plastered on his face, Danny knew this was going to be the worst day of his life. Jimmy was there too, but he, on the other hand, was looking down at his boots. He couldn't face the boy whose fate would be on his conscience forever. Mike pushed Danny forward, and it's only when the boy entered the dome created by the oak's umbrella that he noticed all his belongings scattered across the damp soil. Danny delivered a shaky icebreaker. Can I... Can I have them back, please? Mike and Wayne laughed like antagonists would. Marvin watched Danny with so much hatred, his blood froze in his veins. Sure, Collins. Marvin approached Danny's stuff with two slow steps. Right after I'm finished. He unzipped his pants, looking exactly like he was about to do the thing Danny dreaded most. No. Danny wanted to tackle him. But Mike grabbed him by the arms and forced him to stay put and watch. Don't. Please, no, I'm begging you. Jimmy looked away, shaking almost as badly as Danny was. And Wayne was laughing like a madman. But Marvin, Marvin's face was serene. He had no expression whatsoever as he took out his manhood and relieved himself all over Danny's things. Danny started to cry and Wayne suddenly didn't find the situation as funny anymore. Mike even loosened his grip on Danny's arms, making the boy fall to his knees on the moist ground. Dude, maybe we should stop. Shut up. Danny was so humiliated. He would have been fine with dying right there and then. Even so, more than sad, scared and humiliated, he felt rage. Danny looked at his worst nightmare, teary-eyed, and knew that what he was about to say would either be his salvation or bring his doom. Please, I won't tell anybody, I swear. Jimmy turned his head violently in Danny's direction, eyes wild and mouth agape. Danny had just opened Pandora's box. It was all over the pretty blonde boy's face. Mike and Wayne looked puzzled. What won't he tell, Marv? It was Mike who'd asked the question. Yeah, Marv, what's up? Wayne cried. Marvin's face lost its composure, and Danny knew the boy that just took a massive piss on his belongings was not afraid of facing juvie, jail, or any other type of consequence to make him hurt for what he just outed. Marvin was by him in mere seconds, and hit him over the head so hard, it felt more like a horse's hoof than a human foot. Danny fell to the ground and spat out a tooth. Most people would have surrendered and begged for their lives at this point, 
But Danny, Danny had already played his last card. Danny already had his most expensive possessions pissed on by this human garbage, and him begging further would only make the situation more pathetic and laughable. His rage outgrew the fear within him, and, what was worse, it outgrew his survival instinct. Pick him up, Mike. Marv, don't you think it's enough? Mike asked, even though he did as he was told. He picked Danny up by the pits of his arms and forced him to his knees again. It's enough when I say it is. Marvin fumbled with his zipper again. Open his mouth. I didn't finish unloading yet. This is the part where Jimmy looked genuinely panicked. He and Wayne started making desperate arm gestures to Danny behind Marvin's back, urging him to get up and run. But Danny couldn't see them. He saw nothing but Marvin's crotch and his sick smile somewhere above the parted orange folds and the blue zipper of his oversized jacket. With nothing more to lose, Danny went all in. You know, Marvin, I don't have anything against gay guys. Actually, I'm sure most of them are very nice people. But you, my friend, you're not a gay guy. You're a faggot. Jimmy, Mike, and Wayne held their breaths. Marvin stared Daniel down, his hand unconsciously closing the zipper of his pants. Nobody dared to move. Nobody dared to speak, and in that precise moment, the world stopped, just long enough for Daniel's survival instinct to kick in again. His brain's get-up-and-run command didn't even reach his spine when Mike grabbed him, rose him upright, and tossed him outside of the oak's protective circle. Run, kid. Run as fast as you can. He didn't have to yell it out twice. Danny ran for his life. He ran to his full capacity and beyond, Marvin's thundering gallops right on his tail. This time the bully didn't bother with verbal threats like earlier. He was chasing Danny with the clear intention of physically hurting him, and by the sounds of his exasperated, enclosing exhales, he was about to hurt him very, very badly. Danny passed his track record long before he saw the bridge before him. Even so, Marvin's hard breaths were so close behind him, he could almost feel the warmth of him at the back of his neck. It was when they got to the bridge that Danny knew he was doomed. The sky was deep grey and darkening, and the lake water was black as tar. If that wasn't enough of a bad omen, his loud and frightened feet knocking against the bridge's wooden boards were slowly but surely overpowered by a pair of incoming, trampling boots. No sooner did they reach the pathway semi-occupied by the dark, wild roses than Danny felt cold, hungry fingers be trying to grab him by the back of his shirt. He tripped. How? Nobody knows. He either slipped, or the feel of Marvin made him lose his balance, but he definitely tripped and had his bully surf on his chest for at least seven feet until they stopped. Danny was about to try the apology card again, but he couldn't let out one word. At first, he incredulously looked up at his bully while trying to tell him that his knees are making the thorax implode and that he can't breathe, but Marvin's knees were not on his chest at all. Marvin's knees were at his sides, and the reason why Danny felt choking was because oh, the bully's hands were wrapped around his neck, and they were squeezing hard. Danny let out an indiscernible gag. He tried clinging to Marvin's arms, tried clawing at his face. But Marvin's face was the frozen picture of one intention and one intention only. Murder. He didn't give up clawing at everything he could get his fingers on, even though he felt his head getting dizzy and his vision getting cloudy. Marvin was pressing and squeezing, and mere seconds before passing out, Danny gathered all of his strength not to defend himself, but to point at something. Marvin was too out of it to even notice what was going on around him, but he did notice the change in his victim's demeanour. It changed from fright to confusion. What the hell was he pointing at anyway? 
Daniel was pointing at Marvin's heart. Or so it seemed. Marvin looked down. He didn't notice it at first, but after he blinked once or twice, it dawned on him. His beloved orange jacket with a blue zipper had been completely cut off from the chest down. Marvin immediately let go of Danny's throat, the absence of over half of his jacket being the new focus of his attention. Danny coughed and inhaled greedily as Marvin looked, bewildered, around himself to see why and how and who could have done such a gruesome thing to his most beloved piece of clothing. He turned to look behind himself, and that's when he saw the long, thin, orange thread that connected the remains of his jacket to a small, glowing figure at the furthest side of the bridge. Marvin felt scared for the first time that evening. Danny had gotten enough oxygen in his brain to lift his torso up on his elbows and look in the direction in which Marvin was staring. His blood ran cold. The bridge was dark, and so was the sky. The only things illuminating the scene were a small figure wearing a white garment at the other end of the bridge. The neon glowing orange thread that connected Marvin's jacket to the figure's fist, and those sparkling white eyes Danny knew not to mess with. What the... Chloe had one hand tangled up in the thread of Marvin's jacket, and the other behind her back. Danny's heart began to race again, and for the first time in the last week, it was not for his own sake. No, Chloe, don't. But Clotho would hear none of it. Her decision was made. She revealed her grandmother's scissors from behind her back their massive silver glowing as strong as her eyes were. Marvin was starstruck. He rubbed his eyes, convinced he was dreaming. Poor boy didn't even get the chance to see Clotho snap the scissors shut on his bright orange yarn. Time stopped right then and there. Danny wanted to move, but he couldn't. All he could do was helplessly watch as the wild roses came to life. The buds sniffed the air as if they were hungry felines smelling blood. Some roses slithered on the path like snakes. Others opened their buds up like famished sharks, ready to chow down on their prey. First, there were the questions. The, what the fucks, and what is this, and what are you doing? Then there was a struggling. Then, the ordering around, followed by the refusal. This isn't happening. Get off of me. This isn't happening. The boy was screaming bloody murder by the time one rose ate his right eye and three others sucked at his fingers. A rather bloomed rose entwined its stem around Marvin's neck, digging its thorns into his flesh. The same rose started chewing at the bully's ear, sucking on it like it found something yummy inside his head. Numerous other roses bit at his stomach, his legs, his back, chest, and every other piece of flesh they could find. The plants were hungry, and they were loud, too. Danny couldn't tell who was louder. The roses, who sounded like tigers tearing up a gazelle, or Marvin, who sounded like one hundred piglets up for slaughter. The roses dragged Marvin up to the fence. Since the chunk of flesh that remained of the boy was still too big to fit through the gaps between the fence's iron bars, the roses resumed their feast outside of the fence, for Danny to see clearly. Danny could not believe his eyes. The roses were munching and chewing as if they were predators from the very top of the food chain. Danny remembered. His former friend was supposed to be at the other end of the bridge, so he looked at her just in time to see her deranged grandmother come running out of the house. He stood motionless in the middle of the pathway, sheltered by the shadows, and too far away to be seen by the old woman. The last thing Danny saw before snapping out of his days and running home was Chloe's white robe dancing in the wind of the upcoming storm, and her crying diamond eyes. By the time the mother and grandmother got out of the house to confiscate the scissors out of Chloe's hands, Danny was already halfway home. Clotho, 
spring off one's life. What have you done? He could still hear that last part when he closed the door to his house behind him. Danny cried under the covers until his parents came home. He expected his dad home by 7pm and his mother by 8. But he never thought they'd show up together at 5.30. He was still crying when his mom entered his room, followed by his father. Sweetie, is everything all right? She didn't sound angry anymore. Quite the contrary, she sounded apologetic. She probably realized that she'd exaggerated over the phone earlier and acknowledged that teenage bullies can be very, very cruel at times. Your father and I are home, honey. You wanted to talk about this bully. Danny sat upright and wiped his eyes with the sleeves of his hoodie to see his parents better. Dad turned on the lamp and both parents sat down at Danny's sides, taking Danny's hands in their own. They watched Danny expectantly, their understanding parent faces showing nothing but love. He, Danny sobbed, I went back to school and he had my things. His dad gave his mum an accusatory glance. I wanted to take them back, but he chased me and... Danny cried some more. Something terrible happened. The boy looked scared out of his mind. I think... I think she heard him. And I think she did it for me. What? Who did? Chloe. The girl from the creepy house on Boone Street. Didn't I tell you to stop hanging around that house? His mother exploded. Whom did she hurt, Daniel? Asked his father in a calm voice. Danny inhaled deeply, trying to stop an incoming sob. Marvin. Cage. He lives on Maple Street and he and his friends have been bullying me for months. The sob broke through. Everybody knew Marvin Cage. The Cages had three sons and all of them were assholes. Marvin was the worst. Everybody in the neighborhood knew him from that one time, when he tried drowning Mrs. White's cat. He was ten at the time. Danny expected a compassionate hand on his head and a welcoming pull to cry on someone's shoulder. But these things didn't come, and when Danny wiped his eyes dry enough to make out his parents' facial expressions, he somehow knew why. His mum and dad looked at each other, confusion written all over their faces. His mother spoke. I'm sorry, Danny, but who's that again? Part 10. And you need her, you pathetic little man. Daniel found his school bag and jacket inside his locker the following day. They were as dry as could be, and smelled as pleasant as ever. So, you sure you didn't find them by the oak tree out back? Cleaned them up and put them in my locker? The security guard looked at him dumbfounded, yet amused. What? <laughs> no. That's forbidden territory for us. You kids need your privacy too, you know. I didn't touch your things or your locker. You all right today, young man? Yes. Yes, sir, I'm fine. All right. Run along now. Class is about to start. Class started, and Danny waited all day. Hoped, even, to see that menacing face looking for him through the classroom door window. It never came. During the first break, Danny saw Wayne and Mike passing each other by in the main corridor. They didn't even say hi to each other, and that was very unlike them because they were always together. He also saw Jimmy during lunch, sitting at the weirdo's table, chatting and smooching with the school's goth girl, Lucinda Big. During the last break of the day, Danny even gathered enough courage to approach Jimmy and Lucinda in the hall. Hey, have you heard from Marvin today? Jimmy looked confused. He threw Lucinda a look and she shrugged. Sorry, kid. No clue who that is. Marvin. Marvin Cage. The guy in the orange jacket you always hang out with. Lucinda let out a laugh. You seeing someone behind my back, babe? Jimmy laughed too. If I were, best believe I wouldn't go for a dude. She hit him playfully, and they both giggled. 
What do you mean? You don't know. I saw you in the boy's bathroom yesterday. You were hiding from him. I saw you puking your guts out in the sink. Jimmy got wide-eyed. You saw me do what? When did this happen exactly? Lucinda asked. During last period, sometime between 2 and 2.30 p.m. The two lovebirds exchanged a quick glance. What's your name, kid? Danny flinched. Daniel. Collins. Danny Collins. Danny. Jimmy and I are in the same classes on Thursdays. He was with me the entire time between 2 and 2.30 p.m. yesterday. Danny began to shiver. Are you all right, kid? Do you need help? Should we call somebody for you? Yeah, you don't look too good. Is this some is Marvin guy a friend of yours? Jimmy and his girlfriend looked genuinely worried for him. Are you sure you don't know anybody named Marvin Cage? Yep, pretty sure. Danny felt sick to his stomach. Okay, um, okay. Yes, yeah, okay. Look, sorry. Bye. He turned around and went back to class, not catching the part where Jimmy showed his girlfriend that the little man might be a loony. Right after school was over, Danny got his stuff and went home, the long way round. He looked around, hoping from the bottom of his heart to see the glimmer of the bright orange jacket somewhere behind a tree, or in the window of the bar he saw Marvin exit a couple of days before. Danny was desperate. So desperate that he actually realized what he was doing when Bruce Cage, Marvin's father, answered the door. Yeah. Danny saw some resemblance, all right. He looked exactly like Marvin, but with a beer gut and facial hair. Is Marvin home? Who? Danny was so desperate for answers, he would have entered the house and searched for the bully himself. Marvin, your youngest son, is he home? Uh, no idea what you're talking about, kid. Wrong house. Slam. Danny had no choice. He ran back to the shortcut. The bridge looked fine and the pathway was as gloomy as ever. There was a slight difference, though. It seemed that someone finally found the time to mend the wild roses that stretched outside the fence. Danny looked up at the house and saw nobody. He crouched next to the fence and started to look around for something, anything that would remind the world of the existence of someone named Marvin. But it wasn't there. He got nothing. His friends didn't know him. His family never knew him. Hell, even the vandalism his stuff suffered vanished into thin air. Everything was as if Marvin never even existed. Danny got up and looked at the house again. More terrified than thankful, he turned around and walked home, that time being the very last time he took the shortcut by the creepy house on Boone Street to or from school. Life went on. Danny had to make up some story for his parents regarding his bully, and they never pestered him about it more than necessary. In time, Danny became Daniel, and Daniel stopped thinking about both Marvin and Chloe in favour of focusing on studying and getting into a good college. As time progressed, Daniel found love. He was doing great for himself. His wife was pregnant with their second child, when he quit his job to both invest in a startup company and start his own business. By the time he was in his forties, Daniel was a pretty wealthy guy and life was very good to him. However, it all started going downhill when his father died. The death in itself was no biggie. Mr. Collins was old and sick, and he wished for death long before the pain became insufferable. Daniel's wife didn't want to go to the funeral, and Daniel never even suspected her reason. He found out by accident, not even a month after it happened. She was having an affair. That's okay. Daniel told both her and himself, no marriage is perfect. Maybe he even deserved it, he thought, because even if he wasn't thinking about Marvin every day, 
He learned from an early age that whatever goes around, comes around. Maybe he did something bad and now the universe was getting its revenge on him. It was just a tumultuous period in his marriage. Nothing a couple of counselling sessions wouldn't fix. The problem is, the counselling didn't fix anything. The wife's cheating took the worst turn possible. She fell in love. More than that, she got pregnant again and her lover convinced her to leave Daniel and start a new family with him. So Danny got a divorce. And because both kids preferred their mother, they decided to go stay with her and their new daddy. Even so, Daniel still thought that, well, that's okay. His wife was just being a bully and fate hates bullies. She'll get what she deserves sooner or later. But his ex-wife's life just kept getting better and better. Even though she was over 40 years old when she gave birth to her third child, the birth ran smoothly and the child was as healthy as could be. It was a boy. They named him Marvin. By the time his ex-wife was in her fifties, she travelled the world alongside her three kids and her partner. What's worse is that Daniel's children were tagging Mum's lover with the caption Daddy on social media. And that's okay, Daniel thought. They'll wake up eventually. Life works like that. Daniel began to drink. The startup he invested in two decades prior went bankrupt. And his own business was doing bad too. He had to sell his spacious mansion and move into a shitty 42-foot square apartment before going into complete ruin. He had some money for a little while, but most of it needed to be invested in his children's college funds. Otherwise, his ex-wife would have legally sucked up every little thing he still owned. Daniel had nothing left but his daily bottle of happiness and the reassurance that someday... Someone will do him justice. But that day never came. His daughter became a mother of twins, and it broke Daniel's heart that he never got the chance to meet them. His son turned out to be a movie star, and his mother and new husband were tagged in all the photos of the events he was invited to. Daniel was never invited to any of them, and it slowly stopped being okay. His ex-wife was getting happier and happier, whilst he was getting more and more miserable. And then his mother died. Partially, it was a relief, because his unemployment check stopped covering both the living expenses and his much-needed alcohol supply. Now that his mother was gone, his parents' house was all his, so money for rent wasn't needed anymore. He went back to his roots, with the priciest three things he still owned. An Armani jacket with torn up sleeves, a tablet he stole from a cafe while its owner was in the bathroom, and a beat up Volvo he got as a gift from his 80 year old neighbour out of pity. Daniel's life was as shitty as could be, and it all came flashing back to him as soon as the shield that passed by the passenger window announced him that he had just entered his childhood hometown. Daniel cried, and cried until his shirt was wet at the chest. His life turned to shit, and he knew it. He knew. Karma isn't always a bitch to those who deserve it, but to whomever she fancies. Apparently, he was one of her favourites, because after his dad died, Daniel took blow after blow, while his cheating wife took blessing after blessing. Daniel shut his brain off long before seeing the bridge. It had been remade. It was wider and looked more stable than before. But Daniel was too engrossed in the task at hand to notice it. He stopped the engine of his shitty car as soon as he reached the pathway. The wild roses denied passage to anything broader than 20 inches. But Daniel paid them no mind whatsoever. He wouldn't have been able to even say what colour they were. He entered the yard. The house getting bigger and more menacing with every step he took. The roses got suspicious. They began to hiss and slowly follow Daniel to the main door of the house, inquiring what his business was. Daniel knocked four times, 
The strength of his determination reverberated in the entire house. The roses hissed louder this time, letting Daniel know that he wasn't welcome and they would attack if he made a wrong move. But Daniel didn't care. He was here to report a bully. Someone opened the door just slightly, and Daniel recognised a dark-coloured iris, even though the skin surrounding it was wrinkled and old. It was the naive girl who used to be something of a friend to him once. She was the grandmother now, which meant it was her rightful turn to yield the scissors. Daniel remembered that much from their brief yet eventful encounter. Her name wasn't Clotho anymore. No, Clotho was now the name of her granddaughter. And speaking of her granddaughter, she had just squeezed her little blonde head by Granny's leg to take a look at the visitor. What do you want? Her voice was just as venomous as the hissing behind him. I need your help. And why would I help you? The roses were getting louder. It was a gamble, and Daniel knew it. One inappropriate word from him, and he'd become fertilizer. Because... That's what friends are for. They stared at each other for a couple of seconds. Daniel didn't even flinch, and neither did Atropos. She looked him deep in the eye and read every single sorrow that weighed him down. A desperate man stood before her. Atropos smiled. She would never have admitted it, but she was very happy to see him after all those years. The grandmother stepped aside and, for the first time in the history of the creepy house on Boona Street, the front door was wide open for a welcome guest. Come in, Danny. Come in and tell me all about it. Well, it took me about a year and a half between receiving her third story and me actually getting around to read it. But this one's come around a lot quicker. Ooh, I love that one. Bit of a slow burner, but really, really beautiful story. Very well written, nicely paced, and an absolute joy for me to read. Hope you agree. Did you enjoy it? Let me know in the comments section below the video. And I, of course, will disagree with you if you didn't like it. <laughs> Well, three long ones for you this week. Next week I've got the third of the uh, Halloween anthology stories coming up. Not quite sure what to do on Monday. Any requests? Let me know. I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> but until then, you all have a lovely weekend. Sweet dreams. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>